Selling Sidira is always an experience. I feel a little bit, uh, marketing kind of didn't set me up right. They said business casual. Sudir doesn't even have shoes on. Um, so we'll just we'll kick the shoes off. Does that give me more technical street cred with this audience? I got, if I got to go sockless, I will. It's a little gross. Um, my name is Mike Bouchong. I, uh, I run the data center business here at Juniper Networks. We talk a lot about AI in action. We've talked a lot about the campus. We've talked a lot about the branch. Uh, we just got into the wired side. It's not AI in campus, it's AI in action. We've got to carry that over to the data center. I want to talk a bit about how we do that. So this language, we've always done it that way, is it's some of the most pernicious language in IT organizations anywhere on the planet, right? Every time you want to go and make some change, right? We know that technology is not stagnant. It doesn't move at the pace of whoever the incumbent is. Things come along now and again, a little bit like X-Men style. A, a mutation comes in and, and leaps us forward a couple of years. When that happens, collectively and as individuals, we have to have the courage to do something different. Now, many of you are using MIST today. And in that MIST decision, you took a risk. You said, I'm gonna try something that's new. And that's not just company risk, that's personal reputational risk. Now, there's a saying in our industry, right? No one gets fired for buying IBM. In the networking space, it gets a little bit grosser. No one gets fired for buying Cisco. But I'll tell you what, you don't get promoted for buying Cisco either. We've got to have the ability to go and make change. What I want to do is argue the case for why what we're doing in the campus side and how we're transforming with AI is going to carry its way into the data center. So if you like what you see on the campus, then you have to have a conversation with Juniper about data center. Now, we have a data center portfolio that services the service provider space. We've got customers in the cloud space. We've got the, the enterprise covered. And these, you know, we, we feature the largest companies across the globe in all each of these markets. Now, that portfolio, it's based on primarily Broadcom Silicon. The takeaway here is if you're familiar with like switches and, and common form factors, just presume that we have a familiar form factor that does what you need. But of course, data centers aren't made with switches. They're made with fabrics. They include things like management and operations. And so from that foundation, we've built software on top that allows us to change the way operations happens in data center. We acquired a company a couple years ago called Abstra. And in the same way that MIST has transformed the wireless space and what we're doing in the campus side, Abstra has transformed what we're doing on the data center side. You see the numbers here. We've doubled our data center business in the last two years. Now, if you're sitting there, who cares about whether we've doubled the business? That's a great Juniper thing. What it signals is that something is going on. There is a change that is afoot. And that change means that there is a better way of doing things, and people are betting with their wallets to take advantage of it. Now, there's another event that's going on right now, right? There's like a Cisco Live or something. Everyone's afraid to say the Cisco word for some reason. I didn't get the memo. Cisco, there we go. Everybody's calm. So Cisco's market share, this is what negative 7% CAGR looks like. Now, I don't mention this because I want to take, take shots at Cisco's market share. The point is that it isn't the market rose and so Juniper doubled our business because you know, a, a rising tide floats all boats. No, there's a sinking ship. And as they go down, what this means is that people are transitioning from incumbent ways of doing things. And the reason they're doing that isn't to eke out incremental advantages in pricing. What we've talked about all day today is about fundamentally changing what the point of interaction is and what's you're, what you're capable of from an operations perspective. And that same transformation, it's happening on the data center side. And frankly, Cisco's loss is our gain. So why is that happening? Look, I'll be honest, right? Cisco's gone through some execution challenges. I don't think we have to pick on that. In 2013, they talked about ACI. ACI was actually, and I'll be honest, I was like an, at an SDN company. I was there because I was gonna make SDN millions. I drive a Hyundai, it didn't work out. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's too soon, it still hurts. My wife is pissed. Um, man, uh, moment of silence, hold on. Man, ah, it stings. Um, when I saw ACI, the idea that you could converge operations around applications and data center, that's actually a profound thing to go do. They were trying to make a difference in the operations side. The challenge was that the solution fell over under the complexity that they were introducing to make it work. A bunch of people went out and bought a bunch of Nexus switches, tried to deploy ACI, and they said, it doesn't quite work that way. Here's a professional services contract. 
<laughs> See how that works? No, it's not free. We'll charge you for that every year. And so the, the, it, as that fell over, then certainly Cisco was going to have challenges. But if we think that the transformation that, that is going on in the industry is limited to execution challenges, I don't think we're doing the industry justice. And frankly, I have a bunch of friends at Cisco, so I make fun of them a little bit, but it's a bunch of smart people that work there. They're not dumb. It's not purely an execution challenge. The bigger issue, the strategic issue that is at its core is a change in the workforce altogether. Now take network engineers, right? I'm not a network engineer, but I used to be a trainer, so I guess I'm kind of close. Um, network engineers sort of entered the market in what, like mid-90s, early 2000s as the internet stuff was going on. If we're being honest, network engineers were kind of aging out a little bit. Right? Not, not me, but, but like you all. <laughs> no, none of you, none of you, right? People over at Cisco Live are aging out. Um, but as they age out, right, and then there's the, like the great resignation or the great reshuffling, call it whatever you want, right? There's a change in workforce. The rise of remote work means that people can work for Amazon without living in Seattle. So that changes stuff up. Some people are just making work-life balance because of the, or decisions because of the pandemic. Whatever the reason, there's a wholesale change in the network engineering workforce. Now this is terrifying because the, the bumper crop of network engineers it's not the same group that came up before. They didn't major in networking and do four years at some major university. They're not trained on Cisco Press and, and they don't have like rote memorization of you know, vendor specific syntax that you can use and some certification that says I memorized the commands. They don't have all of that. The next crop of network engineers, they're learning on AWS and Azure and GCP, which means the point of interaction, the point of familiarity isn't the CLI. It's now gonna be the way we consume cloud. It's probably closer to Terraform than it is to Cisco CLI. And what that does is that means that as you try to fill your workforce with people who don't have as much experience and haven't gone through the memorization process, then your mops and sops don't work. And when that happens, you either break everything or you introduce a new way of operating. The reason we've been winning is because we introduced a new way of operating. Now, network automation has been a thing for, I, I've been in the network automation space for like 15 years, is that right? Oh my God, it's 15 years in network automation. And if you look at the millions of people hours that we've poured into network automation, like we are literally nowhere, it's embarrassing. And we have to rationalize with all that effort, why is it that, that things are not more automated? It's not because people are too dumb, it's because network automation is too hard. So DevOps bore out, if you're particularly cynical, right, to make error as human, to propagate error to all server in an automatic way is DevOps. Now, if you don't believe that, ask the folks at Facebook and, and, and tell them to, to recount the story when they had to saw into their data center cages so they could get access because their badges didn't work. That's automation, right? Now, the reason that stuff like that happens, and I love this other one, right? We do this not because it is easy, but because we thought it would be easy, <laughs> right? Automation doesn't make good, automation makes more. If you've got good, it makes more good. But if you have bad, it makes more bad and it's the way to break things at scale. Well, we have to solve around operations and automation. We gotta look at this differently, right? The old approach isn't working. So what do we do? and put up really pretty slides, right? Um, okay, so we acquired a company called Appstra. Appstra is like the literal inventors of intent-based networking, right? And with Appstra, we say, let's go after day zero, day one, and day two, but what if we presume, rather than thinking that people are too slow, we think that networking is too hard? Now, to be clear, networking should be kind of hard, right? We do complex things, but it should be really hard to make mistakes. And if you start with a lens of reliability, then having a different why, not just speed, but reliability, that drives a different what. So I meet with customers all the time, and I talk about network automation and their operational journey and big words like transformation. And I was meeting with a large retailer in Europe. They've got a large e-commerce site. I mean, this is like one of the, the, the biggest e-commerce sites in Europe. And I asked them, I said, how long does it take you to turn up a new server? And I want you all to think in your head how long that should take. Because I was probably thinking the same thing you are. A couple hours, maybe a couple minutes if they're really, operated, if they're really automated. You know, maybe a couple of days if they're kind of slow. Yeah, six to eight weeks. Like, what? How can that be? And they're like, well, because 
we have these blackout windows, right? So we want to make a change. What we do is we schedule the change. It has to queue up until there's a review meeting. They have a review meeting. There's always a take two on the review meeting. They go to the take two of the review meeting. They get to the scheduled maintenance window. The scheduled maintenance window only succeeds about 50% of the time. They go to the second maintenance window, and then they get their servers up. Now, this is interesting because it means the problem, the speed problem, is not how long it takes to configure stuff. I'm going to give you some useful advice. You guys can write this down. If your biggest problem is how long it takes people to key in stuff, right? if, that's, if you're really trying to make it faster and, it's, and keystrokes are the biggest problem that you have, and you're worried about people fat fingering you know, in, in, your, in your networks, now write this down. The best return on investment you will get is send your team to a typing class. Like they will, they will type faster and they will make fewer mistakes and you'll be good. If, however, the biggest problem you have isn't the typing, but the elapsed time, right? It's the coordination between organizations. It's the coordination between tools. If that's the actual problem, then there's other ways to do it. If I could guarantee that a change that you were going to make in your data center today, if I could guarantee mathematically that it was going to work, that it was known good, the thing I would save is not the typing time. We can automate that too, by the way. The thing I would save is all the review time it takes to get that change to the system. That's where the difference is going to be made. Automation is nowhere, not because people aren't capable, it's because we've been trying to solve the, the wrong damn problem. If you want to drive super fast on the freeway, go for it, right? The reason you don't is because you're going to get into accidents. You want to automate today, you know, code some stuff up. The reason you don't do it is because you're going to get into accidents. Take that problem away and you unlock speed. And when you do, you get real value that comes back in return. Now, we do all of this through intent-based networking. If you're not like an intent-based networking person, let me describe it fairly simply. Intent-based networking says, I want the language of networking to be what you want, not how to get it. Now, think about how you get a network today, right? You take hundreds or thousands of distributed devices. You set hundreds or thousands of knobs on them. And when you get it just right, you slowly back away and you don't touch anything. I started my career, uh, I did research for Boeing. I worked on uh, jet engine design. It sounds really cool, it's kind of boring. Um, and I always joke, I'm like, if we built airplanes that we build networks, I would walk everywhere. <laughs> and I would constantly be looking up for falling airplanes, right? We need to change that, and that means flipping what we do. Now, when you do that, when you work at the level of what do you want, not, what, not how do the devices work, then the tool translates what you want into device syntax, into device config. When we do that, by very nature, the product is multi-vendor. We are the only multi-vendor game in town. Our lead customers are using us over the top of ACI, and over the top of Arista, and over the top of Dell, and yes, over the top of Juniper. But by being multi-vendor, we give them a different level of control. And then if you build a network and you're not thinking about security, I don't know what you're doing. We'll talk a bit about security here um, in, in, on the next session. But in the security space, if we know what, this, what the network looks like, then what we can do is start highlighting things like overlapping security policies. So, so you can flag if there's going to be issues or likely issues. And it's not enough to do this at day zero. What happens on day two? So we take that and then we make a model of it. We look at all the network state and we say, this is what a known good network looks like. And when we push it to, to production, then what we do is we say, here's what's actually in production. And if those two things are the same, we give you a big green thumbs up. And if they're different, we tell you what's wrong. What's the number one cause of downtime? Right? It's like fiber seeking backhoes, uh, DNS, probably the top two. Once you get into the networking side, it's human error. What I want to do is provide an environment where we drive human error to zero. When we do this, we see return. You see the numbers in terms of payback and ROI. It's not just about what do you get out of the tool, it's about what, do you, what is required to make the network work day after day after day. And when you do this, you can start rationalizing tools and getting rid of that. That allows you to streamline things. It lets you put people on a smaller number of tools regardless of what their experience is. If I'm not waiting for a CCIE or some certification to uh, prove that somebody has uh, demonstrated they can do something, then I can start to hire and change my workforce up. It means I can start moving workloads around a bit so that different people can do different things. And if I can do that over a multi-vendor environment, 
that it means you can allow the physics or the economics or maybe the features to dictate your next purchase. And our customers, they make those next purchases. Um, I'll start, I'm not gonna go through all these, you can read them, or is the font big enough? You can look at it and see big white blocks if you're in the back. Um, T-Systems was our lead customer, right? Large data center provider in Germany. They actually came to us before the acquisition. They said, you need to acquire this company. We're using it to cap ACI. We would like to build Juniper, but you have to have a, a management story. If you can unify that, then you give us a, a credible strategy to move from where we are to where we wanna be. I said, sold, let's go do that. We did that and then they, and they were able to cap and grow. It gave them flexibility in their vendor choice where their operations previously didn't allow it. Um, the one in the, the upper right, that, that's a Raiffeisen. They're like a large, uh, a large bank. And, and Ernest at, at Raiffeisen, this guy, he's a great engineer. Listening to him, he gets, so he gets super geeked out about the technology and he will go for like days on the technology bit. But the part he was actually most excited about, his procurement team, who he usually has to fight with to get things through, his procurement team became fans of the technology because it meant they could put every RFP out to bid sincerely and they got, uh, they, then they could put things like lead times, anyone dealing with supply chain? Eh, no one, right, that's all solved. Um, they could deal with like lead times, they could put in uh, pricing and then they could force everyone to, to, to bid. The part that's cool, they're not on this screen, we have a Canadian uh, service provider that uses uh, Appster over the top. They had an environment where we couldn't meet their requirements on lead times. And so they swapped to Dell. I have a happy customer because they were able to make a vendor choice and then after that, uh, then they're, they're, they're putting Juniper back in in subsequent builds. It gives you freedom and flexibility. Uh, Tigo, they, they have uh, data centers in like Colombia, in Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, um, Panama. They had issues because they had an uneven workforce, people that acted semi-autonomously, but they needed to deploy the same data centers everywhere. That showed up as like quality problems for them because their procedures and their architectures were always like similar, but kind of different. We rolled Appster in there it solidified the workforce. They're now stamping that out in every location and all the issues they had, those issues are gone. Because when you standardize the architecture and you streamline the testing, what you get is better results. Now I got all the way through this and I didn't even mention AI. Like, so we'd have to be idiots to look at the, all the stuff that you see in Marvis and AI and say, you know, let's, let's keep it in campus. Of course we wanna bring these things together. In a data center, there's some things that are deterministic. They're gonna be, you want them to be the same way every time. For that, we use Appstra. There's some things that are stochastic, probabilistic. We, things like troubleshooting. When we talk about you know, bringing the, the, the tickets down to zero and helping identify where the root cause is, figuring out where you know, the point of DMARC is, the problem is gonna be somewhere between the access port and, 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 and DCI, or it's over the WAN link or whatever. Bringing AI to bear on that problem it supercharges differentiation that we already have. The reason we're at AI in action is that if we can take these things and bring them together into a common, uh, into a common platform, then the things that you're seeing on the MIST side, you start seeing those on the data center side. We've been working at this for quarters now, and that bringing these things together is the key to transforming operations going forward. And so I want to leave you with this, right? When we talk about, you know, things like TCO or we talk about things like agility, it's not only some advantage that accrues at the business level, right? Agility is, and I have, I have 11-year-old twin boys, right? For me, doing things simpler, knowing that it's going to work, that means that I can go to a soccer tournament on a weekend because I'm not worried about, you know, staying after if my production change doesn't, doesn't go the way it's supposed to go. It means I can spend an extra dinner with my family where I otherwise might have had to work. The differences that we make, they're more than just technical. They're more than just the percentages. These are personal differences. Now I'm telling you that that's on the horizon. And whether you're in data center or you merely work alongside other teams that are in data center, it's incumbent upon you today to challenge the status quo. Demand more from your data center. Demand that when you go to RFP, that anybody could legitimately bid for it. I dare you to put out an RFP that any supplier can bid and not be worried about the operational implications. 
I dare you to hire a new college grad because you shouldn't have to have a damn certification and 25 years of experience to provision a pod that's already been deployed hundreds of times in your environment. Or better yet, I dare you to push to production on a Friday. I'm Mike Bouchong, we're Juniper Data Center, and this is what AI in action looks like in Data Center. Now, networking may start with switches, but it certainly includes security. I give you Kate Adams.